Good morning, everyone, and welcome to class 24. Today, we're going to try start uh, applying the faces of power that we discussed last class by looking at the first face of power, and more specifically, at elections and lobbying. To um, so how do voting campaigns and lobbying demonstrate the first face of power? How do they ex influence political outcomes? So our guiding question for today's mini lecture is how can individuals and groups influence public policy and political outcomes? So let's, if we remember uh, the model of the first face of power, right? It's this open decision-making arena in which, and we can just kind of stylize this as Congress, and they are deciding between policy A and policy B. And we probably, let's assume that we have, you know, a roughly even division between representatives and senators. Some, so about half support policy A, about half support policy B. Now, our question is how can uh, concerned citizens, groups of citizens, interest groups, individual corporations, how can all these groups influence uh, policy, the decision making? How can they get people that would vote for policy A to support policy B or vice versa? So on the one hand, we can we often think of like voting uh, as a means by which um, individuals can influence decision making, um, but we can also look at lobbying. How do how does lobbying influence the uh, decision making of of of, uh, of members of Congress? So, so we're going to look at both of these in turn, and we're going to add some complexity to this picture throughout, but trying to show how these demonstrate this first face of power. And so, because the first face of power, right, is it for is the idea that these are going to be resources that. Uh, can be used to influence outcomes, right? That is the kind of logic of the first face of power. So what are real, what are the resources that we're talking about? What resources do voters have? Or what resources can lobbyists use to exert power over congressional decision making? So that is our kind of goal for today. So let's look at voting and elections first. So obviously voting is the most obvious, so means by which citizens choose their representatives and other elective officials. Um, this happens at all levels of government, local, state, federal, um, and this is probably one of the most obvious means by which individuals can influence public policy by determining who will actually be making the public policy. And while elections happen at all levels of government, it is elections themselves are always administered by the states. Um, so the states determine exactly how the elections are going to function, even for um, federal offices. So they will determine exactly like what the ballot's going to look like, whether the ballots are digital or, or paper ballots, whether there's vote by mail, how, how much, if there's early voting and how much early voting, these are all determined at the state level. Keep these questions in mind when we start thinking about the second phase of power. So, how do people register to vote? Um, these voting registration laws vary state by state. Um, and so it really depends on different law, different state laws. Here in California, uh, many localities themselves are experimenting with automatic vote by, mail, vote by mail. So if you're in the Bay Area, if you're in Los Angeles County, if you're in Orange County, you received your ballot in advance that you could drop off at polling centers um, well before election day, or you could mail in. Um, other states have very limited, uh, and you can also register to vote the same day uh, as the election and get a provisional ballot. Uh, other states have very limited uh, ability to reg vote, register to vote. So the 24th Amendment in, uh, ratified in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, these ensured that the right to vote was protected regardless of race, that there could be no uh, racial race-based discrimination in voter registration. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me. These in effect, the 24th Amendment in effect banned uh, uh, poll taxes, um, and the Voting Rights Act included a, a, a clause that required the Attorney General to investigate states with a history of discrimination um, when they re to, and review any potential changes to state election laws. So states that had a history of discriminating based on the basis of race on voter registration and voting access, um, the Attorney General had to pre-clear any sort of changes to their election laws. 
However, this section of the Voting Rights Act was actually ruled unconstitutional in the Supreme Court case Shelby County v. Holder uh, in 2013. Uh, and the courts gave the states the right to execute changes in their election laws without this federal oversight. And this has led to a significant changes, especially in southern states, in rolling in make, rolling back early registration, um, same day voter registration, early voting, and, and, and other efforts without sort of any sort of federal oversight. All, additionally, the National Voter Registration Act, also known as Motor Voter Laws, allows people to register to vote while they get a state driver's license. And some states, such as Oregon, have experimented uh, with online voter registration and automatic voter registration. Um, the, um, the, uh, the Voter Registration Act from 1993 um, actually had mixed results. There's some studies that found that um, that it actually decreased voter turnout, um, and that it, did, it and then other studies have found that it actually just made it easier for people who are already planning on voting. Um, so there's mixed results on the effectiveness of these mode of voter laws. However, there is significant social science research that shows that the specific state regulations on both registration and vote and, and accessibility of the polls really influences the likelihood of voter registration. So what do you, what are the requirements for register to vote? Every state has a residency requirement. Um, you have to be able to prove that you are a resident of the state that you are registered and the locality in which you're registering to vote. Uh, and states vary on how far in advance of an election you have to establish that residence. For some, it, it, these can be very loose. So you, can, you do not have to establish that long of a period of residency and others are much more stricter. There's also a timeline um, of how early, how in advance of an election do you have to be registered to vote. And again, these vary state by state. In states with closed primaries in which uh, only members of that political party can vote in that primary, you also have to register with a party affiliation or register as an independent. In addition to these requirements, states have also different exclusions on who is able to register to vote. Uh, often these exclude certain mental, uh, are, some exclusions are based on mental competency. Um, and here the argument is, is that pe those who are, un uh, who are deemed mentally uh, incompetent that are unable to make decisions for themselves, the concern is that their vote will be manipulated by family members or caregivers. And so that's why they are excluded. Um, and many states also exclude um, based on prison sentences or felony conviction. Uh, and these vary from state to state. Um, for, so there are very few states that grants prisoners while they are in, in prison the right to vote. Um, um, uh, but these then vary all the way from, where, where's my laser pointer? Here we go. Um, the, some states, these in the light blue, um, Everyone has the right to vote except for those who are currently incarcerated. Um, California and, the dark, and Colorado and New York in the dark blue. Um, they extend this to include parole. And this varies all the way to the point with all people with felony convictions are permanently disenfranchised. Um, and so the, um, these differences in the ability to register to vote based on felony convictions really influence um, who the pool of possible voters are and this is a way actually and this is if you think about this much more closer to the second face of power creating this institutional rules on who is excluded from in, uh, using the first face of power so what drives voting and we can look at this both from the uh from from demographic correlates or individual characteristics that drive voting based on a kind of model of rational decision making um but also from the perspective of institutional design so on the one hand oops sorry so what drives voting um age uh is pretty strong evidence that um, older people vote more younger people vote less and there's lots of different reasons for potential reasons for this from knowledge, greater social capital, uh, their socialization to be, they're, they're socialized to vote. Um, they also have more free time um, if you're a retired person. Education is highly correlated with likelihood of voting. Those with college degrees are, uh, are more, uh, voted a rate of 75%, or those with only high school degrees voted a rate of 52%. And again, we can talk about the lower information costs for those with college degrees. Um, 
Education is often correlated with income. Higher income voters vote more than lower income voters. Again, we're trying to, this is, uh, the costs are lower. You are more, a, more able to take time off to learn about the candidates to, or to, to take uh, time to work, uh, vote. Um, voting is also correlated along racial lines with uh, white Americans and African Americans the most likely to vote, where Asian Americans and Latinas less likely to vote. And these are less kind of explained by individual rational incentives here, uh, but more about history, political culture, and institutions, right? Uh, um, the so if you think of like African American, uh, the African American Civil Rights Movement, uh, often was premised around mobilizing for the for ensuring their right to vote, and so you have this like political socialization and political culture around voting here, um, where you don't necessarily have the same. Uh, there's some speculation that there's not the same type of political socialization uh, with Asian Americans uh, and Latinos, though there is evidence in more recent data of. Um, of, a, of Latino vote, vote, uh, vote per shares increasing more recently. Additionally, uh, women outvote men. Um, uh, uh, dis, uh, even though, despite the fact that women were disenfranchised, um, you know, for the over the first century of the, the republic's existence, and so we can think of that history of disenfranchisement as kind of creating this like a political culture around voting. But it's important not just to look at these individual characteristics, but to look at how institutions are set up. Uh, obviously, voting is not mandatory in this country, um, and so that create there it's uh, that creates an incentive to not vote if the if you, you if the opportunity to vote. Um, different states having different voter ID requirements influence the ability, especially for poor uh, people, to and, and people who live in cities who might not drive and not might have driver's license um, to limits their ability to vote. There's pretty robust social science findings on this that um, voter ID requirements not only depress turnout overall, but they disproportionately depress turnouts for poor minority and urban areas. Um, the limited time available to vote, and by this I mean the fact that election day is always on a Tuesday, um, even though businesses and corporations are legally required to give you time off to go vote, um, if everyone is going to vote over their lunch break, um, voting the polling lines might be too long. It might be longer than the time that your boss has given you. Um, you might not want to take that time off because there's um, because you need need that time money, um, especially if there's going to be long lines. And and so states there's some speculation. And so states that have more early voting, vote by mail, um, more likely to see higher turnout. Also, there's questions of political culture, um, both within demographic groups and, all, and within political communities. Like, is there a strong socialized uh, influence to in, uh, inculcating this kind of like all, civic obligation to vote? So once people have decided to vote, how do they decide who they're going to vote for? And political scientists often refer to three different strategies. Uh, the most common one is this idea of retrospective voting, and they view the election as a referendum on the on the incumbent party. So it's a referendum on the party that's current in office, and it's usually a referendum based on kind of like how strong is the economy, is the country at war, has there been like major social issues going on, and so this is why um, like uh, you can see this is pretend why uh, the Trump administration in the context of the coronavirus has been so trying to emphasize um, economic growth, um, trying to emphasize this, uh, the stock market, trying to boost that because it provides heuristics for people to vote in November based on this retrospective voting. Similar, um, and this is uh, people vote based on their pocketbooks, and this is similar to retrospective voting, but it's voting less based on the overall state of the country and the economy and more based on their personal finances. Are they employed or not? Have they lost their job? Have they lost part of their savings? Um, do they feel that there is less, they have less money in their pocket than they did four years ago? That's going to influence who's going, who they're going to vote for. Less common is prospective voting. Um, so voting less about punishing the incumbent party for failing and more about thinking about using existing trends, existing behavior and knowledge to make projections about what is likely to happen in the future. And this is really hard. This requires a lot more cognitive effort, which is why most people kind of vote retrospectively, because it's hard to think about what the world's going to look like over the course of the next four years. 
But voters aren't the only, it's not simply that voters are trying to influence candidates by uh, decision making by selecting candidates, but candidates are trying to influence voters uh, through campaigns. And political campaigns have two primary goals, and these are also influences, ways of influence based on the first face of power. They're trying to persuade voters to support a candidate, and they're trying to motivate those supporters to actually overcome the bear, uh, opportunity costs and vote. Now, importantly, both of these require money to run ads, uh, to canvas supporters, to encourage people to get out to vote, to call the likely voters, to knock on doors, to put signs in places, to have volunteers in every district and precinct, all of this, uh, volunteers and paid staff, all of this requires money. And because of that, there's been a lot of debate over campaign finance regulation. Campaign finance laws date back to the 19th and early, late 19th and early 20th century um, to ensure transparency in campaign finance. These limited the rights of government workers to support political campaigns as well as certain corporations to do so. Um, but these became much more formalized in 1971 with the Federal Election Campaign Act that set certain limits on expenditure uh, on campaign contributions and required the reporting that campaigns report all of their contributions and expenditures. And this is the idea that we should know who's funding different campaigns for transparency. However, in the Supreme Court case of Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, uh, the Supreme Court found that limits on personal spending by candidates were unconstitutional. Um, and so this basically empowered uh, candidates to rather than take public available financing uh, from the federal government to, as long if they forego the, the public finance money as they did on campaigns. In 2002, Senators uh, McCain, John McCain and Russ Feingold tried with a past piece of legislation that would restrict the amount of money uh, given to political parties and prohibited coordination between political parties and, and, and candidates with political action committees or PACs. However, later court decisions like the 2003 decision of McConnell versus the Federal Election Commission and Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Uh, a commission in 2013 basically eroded these limits and it allowed for unlimited money from both individuals with McConnell v. FVC and corporations with Citizens United to into independent super PACs. Now, super PACs are political action committees that are issue oriented, uh, that they cannot contribute money directly to candidates. They cannot su directly support a candidate or, or, um, or coordinate with candidate campaigns but they can run issue specific ads that kind of prime voters to vote in particular ways. And, and this is where a lot of the kind of concern about money uh, in politics is going. So, and it, so what exactly are campaigns kind of targeting and how, who are the voters that they're trying to influence? Now, the idea, most of this is driven by the idea of the median voter theorem, um, that if we assume that voters' preferences are uh, evenly distributed in, in the population, right? He, the idea that a majority of the votes are somewhere in, in the middle of the ideological spectrum, the majority of the voters, and so they're going to, candidates are going to try to appeal to the median voter. They're not going to appeal to someone way out here they're not going to try to appeal to someone way out here, right? Because if you if you are on the far right or the far left, you're more likely to support someone closer to the middle here than someone over here, right? Um, and vice versa. Now, this again assumes that the uh, distribution is normal. But if we think about the debates over polarization, right? And if the distribution of political preferences is actually something like this, right? If we, if the arena is wrong, and 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 the candidates are and the uh, the population's political opinions are growing more and more separate, then you see less of an incentive to move to the median voter and more of an incentive for candidates uh, to try to solidify this base and maybe appeal here in this area is less and you're, there's less votes in this area here right but it also matters whether we're talking about a primary campaign or not uh, or a general in a primary campaign 
um, the we're only trying to appeal to voters on one side here. Um, so even if the median voter theorem is true and the and the assumption about normal distribution of preferences is right, you're still appealing to these people. So the median voter in in this case is actually um, much farther to the uh, is much farther to the right and to the left. So we're looking at the median voter over here and over here in the primary election. Um, and so not only are campaigns and candidates going to be focusing much more on the ideological extremes of their party, um, but the factors that drive it are going to be things like name recognition. Um, do people know who you are? How visible are you? Um, this is why it's often. Uh, um, this is why advertisements and debates are really important uh, in the primary because people need to know who the candidates are. And here you're actually going to get more of an issue focus, right? Uh, this is, you're going to see, because, and you saw this in discussions of healthcare in the Democratic primary that there's a huge debate between the more moderate wing and the more left wing of the party over Medicare for all, uh, and trying to figure out where exactly what the Democratic electorate stands on this issue, uh, knowing that most Democrats will probably still vote for the party nominee. Now, in general elections, the factors are much more about undecided or independent voters trying to um, trying to get back to this median voter over here rather than the ideological extremes. And part and this is because most voters are straight ticket voters um, that they are going to vote for whoever the party nominee is. Um, so you're trying to appeal to people who are not who are not a straight ticket voter who might be undecided or might be moderate voters. Now, in the general election is the goal is to motivate turnout, that you're probably not going to persuade that many people, but your goal is to try to get as much as, as much possible of your side of the vote to vote uh, to the polls versus the other side. So do campaigns actually matter? And the political science evidence is that it's not as much as we'd like to think, um, that we put a lot of stock in like magical campaigns, um, but the fundamentals of why people vote and why people vote the way they do are things like political identity, party ID, and the strength of the economy. And these are not things that even the most skilled campaigner can, can affect. Um, additionally, uh, there are a few undecideds by election time that often uh, the most people have made up their minds about who they're going to vote for. And so we're, talking, we're not talking about these massive swings in public opinion. Additionally, incumbents tend to have a strong advantage. Um, incumbent presidents have a very, very strong uh, re-election. Uh, like look at uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, uh, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, uh, Richard Nixon, all of one re-election. Um, and, and so it's uh, incumbents tend to win re-elections. The incumbency rate for in the Senate is 71% or higher, and it's about 86% in the House. Uh, and this is because incumbents have the value of name recognition. They have voting records that they can campaign on to show that they can actually get things done. They have this thing known as the franking privilege, which is um, they can send mail to their constituents free of charge, um, like informing their constituents of all the good things that they do. And they often benefit from gerrymandered safe districts. So when do campaigns matter? Uh, when there's large numbers of undecideds, when there's more undecided, and so this means that there's going to be, that they're going to matter more in the primary election where there's greater numbers of undecideds rather than later in the election. Um, and when there are extreme resource imbalances, uh, when there's significant imbalances in financial resources or news coverage, um, that's when campaigns can make up a difference. So what are campaigns actually trying to do? They're unlikely to persuade, they're not going to change people's minds, but they might get the base to rally around them and, and, and become an, an issue stronger support for their candidates. Um, they're going to mobilize, get out to vote. They're also going to prime the issues that voters are going to focus on. They're going to focus on issues that are to the advantage of the candidate. Um, and so when candidates are going to benefit from the fundamentals, like a strong economy, you're going to see voters talking about economy. Uh, the incumbents talk about the economy in their campaigns. When the economy is bad, you're going to see the challenging party and challenging candidates do it, bringing up the economy, right? They're going to prime the issues in order to get as much of their base activated as possible.
So we can add a little bit of nuance here to our first face of power, right? The resources that we're talking about here are votes and campaigns, right? Um, because the proximate goal of every sitting representative or senator is to get reelected, and voters hold that resource, so they can influence campaigns and kind of exert influence. Uh, they can influence candidates in that way. Um, but candidates have a way to try to influence voters too um, through campaigns. Um, so voting itself, however, is a pretty blunt instrument. It doesn't actually tell candidates what, or, or elected representatives how to vote on every issue, right? It's much more of a check on power than a direct influence. Um, and similarly, campaigns do exert some influence on political behavior, but not as much as we would like to think. So let's think about what lobbying can do. And how can interest groups exert their influence on decision making, since interest groups aren't I mean, they're made up of voters, right? But they're, they don't get a vote themselves. So they can try to influence through electoral pathways. They can participate in camp political campaigns by ranking or endorsing candidates, like groups like the NRA, Planned Parenthood, the NRDC, the Sierra Club. Um, they all endorse or rank different candidates to try to influence who their members and other people who rely on these interest groups for heuristics might vote for. They, the other big way is funding PACs and super PACs, right? They are going to provide financial support for political action committees and for these and for interest groups that are going to help fund the campaigns. More directly, they can try to influence lawmakers by persuading them to vote in particular ways. Often they might provide information to, uh, to specific uh, lawmakers. They might say, like, look, we've polled your constituents and we know, and here's why this bill, if you vote for it, will benefit your constituents. Um, they can provide model legislation to policymakers. Um, they can promise electoral contributions um, either to their campaign or to super PACs or, or that they can you know influence their members to contribute to those campaigns. Now lobbyists can target not simply Congress uh, specific lawmakers and committees make the most sense, but they also try to influence executive agencies trying to influence how try to persuade and influence how laws are interpreted and enforced. They also engage in judicial lobbying. They can try to lobby particular congressmen uh, and women and, ex and presidents over judicial appointments. And this is what the Federalist Society does in trying to, and it provides a risk of like approved judicial nominees to the president that would be conservative uh, nominees uh, to federal judiciary. And interest groups can also write amicus curiae briefs, uh, these friend of the court briefs to try to influence justices on how they should decide. So here, right, we see different pathways in which lobbyists can influence political outcomes, right? They can try to influence uh, uh, congressional decision-making directly through promises of money or information, or they can try to influence this pathway here by providing money for political campaigns um, that is going to influence this kind of direction of power here. Now, all of this is really based on this idea of pluralist theory, and that is, the, and if we kind of think back to what we started in this class with, that, that, that power is more or less evenly distributed throughout society and whichever group of individuals can mobilize the most resources in terms of finances and votes to influence decision making, makers will realize, see their interests realized in public policy. Now the question is what's missing from this picture? What are some of the, what are some of the aspects of policy making and influences on policy making that aren't included in this pluralist or this first face of power? Next class, we're actually going to talk about a few of these, um, looking at the media, uh, um, interest groups again, and political culture for thinking about the second and third faces of power. So how are these faces of power illustrated in American politics? Now, for the discussion thread prompt for this, this, uh, this, this uh, first face of power lesson, do you think that the account of political influences, influence based on the first face of power, in which individuals and groups mobilize electoral and financial resources to influence decision makers, do you think that this is an accurate description of American politics? What, if anything, is missing from this picture? Now remember, you can write on any of the topics, but you do have to write one 200-word reply by Friday at midnight, and you have to reply to one of your peers' posts with a 100-word reply uh, by Sunday at midnight. Um, so that is it for today. Um, I hope that this 
uh, helps clarify the first phase of power and get a little insight on voting, elections, campaigns, and lobbying. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, drop into office hours or the discussion sections on Friday. Uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and engaging a discussion with you. As always, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, prioritize taking care of yourself and what's important. Let me know if there's anything I can do to support you, uh, and I will see you next class.